First reading is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, and reading from verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And our second reading in James, the book of James, chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 9. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are, given, are giving to be judged, as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. And our last reading in Matthew chapter 5. And the Lord is speaking in verse 7, and he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. May God bless the understanding of his word to us. Indeed. Thank you. In the Sermon on the Mount, we find ten sayings of Jesus that we call the Beatitudes. Now, we call them that because that's an archaic word that's based on the Latin word for blessing. A Beatitude is a blessing. So, really, it would be better if our English translations had the heading, the blessings, uh, rather than a word that's become a bit of religious jargon. This is a series of blessings pronounced by Jesus on certain kinds of people. These blessings or beatitudes come at the very beginning of the ministry of Jesus to Israel. He's been to the Jordan River to be, to be baptised by John the Baptist who introduces him to the world as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
and he has returned to Galilee where he's just chosen 12 of his disciples as apostles. The Beatitudes are part of the famous Sermon on the Mount, uh, so-called. In fact, they are the beginning of it. And they go like this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Now I'm departing from my normal practice of preaching through a passage today by focusing on just the fifth beatitude, blessed are the merciful. In effect, this is really a topical sermon on the subject of biblical mercy. And as we think about the fifth beatitude today, blessed are the merciful, I want to begin with three fictional examples that point us toward the quality of mercy, what it is and what it looks like and why we should pursue it. The first example is from one of my favourite books of all time, J.R.R. Tolkien's The Lord of the Rings. And towards the beginning of that work, Tolkien wrote a scene that has burned itself into my memory as one that shows that Tolkien understood the biblical concept of mercy. In this scene, Gandalf the wizard is talking to Frodo the hobbit about the experience that Frodo's uncle Bilbo had many years earlier with a creature named Gollum in a scene that appeared in Tolkien's early, earlier work, The Hobbit. There is a scene in The Hobbit where Bilbo is very much in the same position that King David was in when he had the opportunity to kill King, uh, King Saul in the cave, but chose not to. Bilbo has a knife and he has a magic ring on that makes him invisible. Gollum has threatened to kill him and is trying to catch him to do so. Yet Bilbo chooses to let him go. And the scene in The Lord of the Rings opens like this. What a pity that Bilbo did not stab that vile creature when he had a chance, says Frodo. Pity? It was pity that stayed his hand. Pity and mercy, not to strike without need. And he has been well rewarded, Frodo. Be sure that he took so little hurt from the evil and escaped in the end because he began his ownership of the ring so, with pity. I am sorry, said Frodo, but I am frightened and I do not feel any pity for Gollum. You have not seen him, Gandalf broke in. No, and I don't want to, said Frodo. I can't understand you. Do you mean to say that you and the elves have let him live on after all those horrible deeds? Now, at any rate... He is as bad as an orc and just an enemy. He deserves death. Deserves it? I dare say he does. Many that live deserve death. And some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? Then do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment. For even the very wise cannot see all ends. I have not much hope that Gollum can be cured before he dies, but there is a chance of it. That scene from The Lord of the Rings highlights the struggle that we can have feeling any kind of sympathy for those who have done worse things than we have. We want complete justice without mercy toward those who have done terrible things, especially if they've done them to us. We see this sentiment come out in lynch mobs, in social media frenzies, as people noisily judge others whose public sins has, have thrust them into the spotlight. We see it in calls for politicians to breach the separation of powers between the parliament and the judiciary by establishing more and more mandatory sentencing laws that take away any latitude a judge may have because of mitigating circumstances or in the hope of more effective rehabilitation. Like Gandalf, you know, having that hope, well, maybe Gollum uh, can be saved in the end. 
We're quick to deal out condemnation and judgment to others. But Gandalf's words to Frodo make us pause and consider whether, whether we are qualified to do such a thing. Deserve it? I dare say he does. Many that live deserve death and some that die deserve life. Can you give it to them? Then do not be too eager to deal out death in judgment. I'm reminded of that little story about James and John, the sons of thunder, wanting Jesus to call down judgment on uh, some town that has rejected them. In biblical terms, what Tolkien is reminding us is that God is the dispenser of justice, not us, and that we are not qualified to judge and condemn the wicked by our own private judgment. Instead, a better guide for us is pity. We may feel revulsion for those who do wicked things. We may feel anger towards those who do wicked things towards us. But it is better to pity them than to despise them. And pity is the first stepping stone to mercy. The second fictional story I want to turn to is in the Bible. Now, I'm not saying the Bible is fiction, of course, don't mishear me. But there are some fictional stories in it, uh, like the parables that Jesus told. They are made up stories that teach moral and theological truths by using fictional characters. And perhaps the most famous parable of all goes to the heart of what mercy looks like. It is, of course, the parable of the Good Samaritan. But we could equally call it the parable of the unmerciful priest and the unmerciful Levite. Because by their negative example, it teaches us what lack of mercy looks like. And outside the parable itself is also the negative example of the Pharisee who asked Jesus, who is my neighbour? And Jesus told him this parable to show him that he was barking up the wrong tree by asking that question. The real question is not, who is my neighbour, so that I can work out who not to show mercy to. The real question is, who can I be a neighbour to? Who can I have compassion on? They are my neighbour. Now, I'm not going to read the whole parable, you know it well, about the man who falls among thieves on the hot, dusty road from Jericho up to Jerusalem and how two religious Jews, a priest and a Levite, who were commuting to and from their job at the temple, passed by on the other side of the road and were unwilling to help. But a despised Samaritan, an enemy of the Jews, did stop, did help, even though he had no obligation to do so. This man was not a family member. He was not of the own race or religion of the man lying there. But the Samaritan had mercy on him. That is, he showed compassion. He showed pity. He bound his wounds. He took him to a hostel and paid for his convalescence. And at the end of the parable, Jesus asks the man who was trying to justify by his attitude towards those who were not of his own kind, which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The religious scribe who asked the question couldn't bring himself to say the Samaritan, so he answered, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus tells him, go and do likewise. So in that parable we see that mercy includes going out of our way to do good to those in need that we are not obliged to help. The Old Testament speaks a lot about this kind of mercy, feeding the poor, helping widows and orphans in their distress and caring for the stranger, the alien, the refugee, the foreigner among you. In the Middle Ages, Jews and Christians made up lists of things that helped to define what mercy is. <clears throat> There were two main lists, acts of physical mercy and acts of spiritual mercy. Uh, these acts were taken from biblical passages like Isaiah 58 or Deuteronomy 15, as well as extra-biblical works 
uh, like some of the apocryphal books or various Jewish Mishnahs. And I think they are helpful lists. It's not scripture, but it's helpful for us to look at, to get a picture of what mercy is. And the seven physical acts of mercy that these lists list are often seen in, in late medieval and Renaissance era paintings, uh, like the one on the screen there. And those acts are to feed the hungry, to give water to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, to shelter the homeless, to visit the sick, to visit the imprisoned or ransom the captive, and to bury the dead. And that last one, of course, was very important during times of plague. There's a similar list of spiritual mercies, to instruct the ignorant, to counsel the doubtful, to admonish the sinners, to bear patiently those who wrong us, to forgive offences, to comfort the afflicted, and to pray for others. I'm not saying that either of those lists is comprehensive, but I think they do help us to get our minds around in a practical way what sort of things we can do to be showing mercy to others. And you see that mercy is far broader than just forgiveness, which is one of the seven things listed there. But forgiveness, and forgiveness given freely and generously, is at the very core of mercy. The third fictional illustration or passage that I want to turn to illustrate mercy uh, comes from Shakespeare. I think outside the Bible itself, this is perhaps the most profound statement about mercy in the history of English literature. And it comes in Act 4, Scene 1 of Shakespeare's play, The Merchant of Venice. Some of you may have had that play inflicted on you at, in school. Um, in that scene, Portia is acting as a defence counsel for the merchant who is being brought to law by the moneylender Shylock, who wants his pound of flesh nearest the heart, literally. And she addresses the court with these famous words, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth like the gentle rain from heaven upon the place beneath. It is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. His scepter shows the force of temporal power, the attribute to awe and majesty wherein doth sit the dread and fear of kings, but mercy is above the sceptered sway. It is enthroned in the hearts of kings and it is an attribute to God himself. And earthly power doth then show likest gods when mercy seasons justice. So the first thing she says there is that the quality of mercy is not strained. And uh, that, that's a, if I read it right, Shakespeare is employing a play on words, a pun here. Uh, strained means both put through a sieve and also constrained or forced. So he's saying mercy is not something to force through a sieve and portion out in tiny amounts, uh, a grain at a time. Nor is it something that can be enforced. You know, it's not like, okay, I'll have mercy on him. It's, it's something that has to be done freely. You can't force someone to act mercifully. It's like the rain that drops from heaven on the whole earth, on everybody. And that recalls that verse, of course, about being like your father in heaven. He sends his rain and his son on the righteous and the unrighteous together. It's a free and unconstrained blessing meant to be given generously. And uh, Shakespeare is no doubt uh, recalling that saying of Jesus, which is later in the Sermon on the Mount. Love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. I suspect that uh, Shakespeare had those verses in mind when he wrote. And Portia's speech reminds us that showing mercy and forgiveness blesses twice. It not only blesses those who receive our mercy, but also those who give. 
It blesses us to do it. Which is exactly the message of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Portia also alerts us to the fact that mercy is mightiest in the mightiest. It shows a monarch to be more powerful than any other symbols of power. His crown, his scepter. Indeed, mercy resides in a far higher place than an earthly throne. Because when a monarch or a magistrate shows mercy, they are in fact being like God. Mercy is a virtue precisely because it is an attribute of God himself. He is the mightiest monarch and his mercy is the mightiest mercy. There's one other thing that we learn from Portia's speech, but I'll leave that until later. I want to move on now to the effect of receiving mercy, which is to give more mercy. And I want to turn to yet another parable, that of the unmerciful servant, because I think it helps us to answer the question, which comes first? Which is the cause and which is the effect? Does giving mercy earn us mercy? Is that what blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy means? Or does it point in an entirely different direction? Turn with me to Matthew 18, verse 21, the parable of the unmerciful servant, where we read this. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And he began the settlement, as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, cancelled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancelled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant, just as I had on you? In his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. So we can see from that parable that the question is not, do you have to be merciful in order to receive mercy, to earn mercy? But rather, how can you possibly receive mercy and then not give it? God has forgiven you infinitely more than you will ever forgive someone else. Mercy is something that we need to pay forward. And it is the antidote to paying people back in vengeance. Jesus is not teaching in this beatitude that we have to earn mercy by giving it. But if you are an unmerciful person, that is evidence that you yourself have not really understood or received the mercy of God yourself. Because if you had, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't treat others in that way. Let me take you back to Portia's speech. After talking about how mercy is not something to be stingy with and that it adorns the mighty better than a crown or scepter and that it is an attribute of God himself, she continues, Therefore, Jew, though justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy. And that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. I have spoken thus much to mitigate the justice of thy plea, which if, if thou follow, this strict court of Venice must needs give sentence against the merchant there. Shakespeare is alluding here to what the Apostle James tells us when he says that mercy triumphs over judgment. 
Mercy mitigates the strict sentence of the law. Portia is saying that showing mercy is evidence that we ourselves understand mercy and live by mercy because without God's mercy to us, none of us would be saved. That's what she says. Giving mercy is evidence of receiving mercy. And that's what this beatitude is getting at. It's not saying that the way to earn mercy is to give mercy. That would make no sense, since mercy cannot be earned. It is freely given to those who have done nothing to deserve it. The Beatitudes are all about life in the kingdom of God. What form that that would take was not yet clear when Jesus spoke these words beside the Sea of Galilee on the hillside south of Capernaum. But we know now, on the other side of his death and resurrection and ascension and his sending of the Holy Spirit, we know now that the kingdom of God is expressed on earth through us, through the church, through his forgiven people. The church, when gathered together and when interacting with the world, is the arena in which these beatitudes are put into practice. The church is where true mercy is given and received and passed on to others. Church is a communion of mutual grace relationships. We treat others as God has treated us, with mercy and compassion. Ephesians 4 tells us about this. It says, Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behaviour. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. And likewise, in Colossians 3, it says, Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults. We always make allowance for our own faults, don't we? And forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Don't be like the world. Don't try to win in the way that the world wins. Our triumph is not in revenge or even in justice, but in mercy and compassion and love. The triumph of mercy is the triumph over ourselves, over our own selfishness, over our own blindness, over our own arrogance. And above all, as James reminds us, and I finish with these words, Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy.